Near the peak of Mount Everest, there is a yellow band of rocks, and that band of rocks is actually a limestone. And based on fossils, it is a deep water limestone. So what we have is a rock that formed in one of the lowest places on Earth, in the ocean, sitting on top of the world. How did that happen? If you think about erosion, it has the incredible ability to flatten the tallest mountains and fill the deepest basins. But erosion doesn't do the opposite, all right? Erosion won't take low places and make them high. To understand that yellow band of rocks, we need to understand that there are processes that move the crust and there is a significant amount of evidence that supports this. When you take a simple look at the variation of elevation across the planet, you'll see that there's a pattern. Of course, there are outliers, right? Mount Everest, Marianas Trench, but most land elevation is below one kilometer, the majority being below 600 meters. And if you look at ocean depths, you'll find that the average depth is 3.7 kilometers, but the vast majority is between 4 and 5 kilometers deep. Something is maintaining the land elevation around 600 meters and the ocean depth around 4 to 5 kilometers. To explain this, we need to understand why continents and oceans seem to have mobility. This is where plate tectonics comes in. Plate tectonics is an extremely efficient theory that explains why the Earth's crust moves and behaves the way it does. Plate tectonics is known as a great unifying theory because it brought together many separate observations. It is referred to as a paradigm shift because before plate tectonics, geologists knew mountains, volcanoes, earthquakes, occurred in some places and not others without really understanding why. Plate tectonics connected the dots. It helped us understand why these features and processes occur where they do. Does the theory work perfectly everywhere, every time? No, absolutely not. But it is still amazingly efficient. Now, before we talk any further about plate tectonics, we need to talk about the ideas that came before it. This is where continental drift comes in. Continental drift is a hypothesis widely attributed to Alfred Wegener, even though he wasn't the only one to come up with this idea independently, he was the first to come up with a lot of supporting evidence, so we, we will focus on him. Wegener was a meteorologist who did much of his work in Greenland and he specialized in snowfall and ice. As he worked with glaciers, he noticed that glaciers are at ice sheets, they flow and move, albeit slowly. And while these big masses don't appear to be mobile, they can actually move a significant amount over time. With this awareness in mind, he thought it could be possible that the continents were moving in the same way since it appeared as though the continents fit together like a puzzle piece. But he went beyond that to gather supporting evidence. He began to look at the geology across different continents. And the obvious start was South America and Africa because geometrically they, they fit together very well. He found that there were, in fact, geologic belts that existed across both continents. There were fossil assemblages, like freshwater crocodilian that couldn't swim across the ocean, that matched across continents. And there was also strong evidence of ice movement across continents, all supporting the idea that South America and Africa were once joined. Similar observations were made that connected the other continents as well, leading to his hypothesis that all of Earth's landmass was once joined as one giant landmass, and he called it Pangaea, which means all Earth. Wegener had a lot of evidence, but the major flaw in continental drift hypotheses was the mechanism he proposed. He suggested that the continents uh, moved by 
flowing through the crust in the same way that an icebreaker ship would force its way through ice. He suggested that tidal forces of the moon and sun were pulling the continents, to which geophysicists outright did not accept, basically saying not physically possible. And geologists pointed to the rock strength contradiction, right? If the ocean crust was so weak that it could be plowed through, then why don't we see buckled and folded oceanic crust? Instead, we see buckled and folded continental crust, which forms mountains, right? So it, it wouldn't make sense if it was so strong that it could plow through oceanic crust. This reluctance to accept new ideas is what science is all about, right? Anytime you have a drastic new idea, you need good evidence. And Wegner did have good evidence, but it wasn't complete. Not every scientist thought he was completely off base. Many Southern Hemisphere geologists thought he, his observations fit very well, but it was just a mechanism part of his theory that needed to be reworked. It wasn't until World War II when new data became available, largely due to the search of enemy submarines actually, that the idea of drifting continents resurfaced. Data detailing things like ocean bottom topography, uh, oceanic crust age, magnetism of the sea floor, all of these things helped Harry Hess and Robert Deitz propose a mechanism that could explain why continents appear to have moved. They suggested that oceanic crust was spreading apart at underwater mountain belts, carrying the continents apart through a process that they called seafloor spreading. This all renewed interest in Wagner's idea of continental drift, which morphed into the theory of plate tectonics. That proposes the Earth's crust is broken up into a dozen or so rigid lithospheric slabs or tectonic plates. These plates, they move. They move relative to each other. They move away from each other, toward each other, or past each other. Tectonic activity are processes that deform the lithosphere and things like volcanism and earthquakes. Plate tectonic theory explains why we have tectonic activity where we, where we do, and it overwhelmingly tends to be at the boundaries of tectonic plates.